Well, our reading this evening is from the Old Testament scriptures, from the opening book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, and uh, we read in chapter 45. Genesis and chapter 45, and we'll take time to read the whole of this chapter. Genesis 45 and at the verse 1. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom he sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that he sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hasty, go up to my father and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near to me. Thou and thy children and thy children's children, and thy flocks and thy herds and all that thou hast, there I will nourish thee. For yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and the household and all that thou hast come to poverty. And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And he shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt. And of all that he have seen, and he shall haste and bring down my father hither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And, men, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come. And it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto, you, unto thy brethren, This do ye, lay your beasts, and go, get you to the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and ye shall eat the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, this do ye, take your wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones, and for your wives, and bring your father, and come. Also regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. And the children of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh, and gave them provision for the way. To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment, but to Benjamin he gave three hundred pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. And to his father he sent after this manner, ten asses laden with the good things of Egypt, ten she-asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way, so he sent his brethren away, and they departed. And he said unto them, See, that he fall not out by the way. And they went up out of Egypt, and came to the land of Canaan, and to Jacob their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive. And he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he said unto them, and when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Amen. Well, as I said this morning, I'm very grateful for your invitation to come and preach and for the warmth of your welcome and fellowship. And uh, it's good to be with you again this evening. 
and I should like to preach to you from Genesis chapter 45 and focus our attention upon the 13th verse of that chapter where Joseph says to his brothers, tell my father of all my glory in Egypt. Tell my father of all my glory in Egypt. And the picture that is painted for us here is a very vivid picture in the life of Joseph of the glories of Christ. Now, very often we use words and perhaps we're not exactly sure in what context we are using those words. And the word glory can mean a number of things, but in the context of what we are considering here this evening, it means exaltation, splendor, and honor. Exaltation, splendor, and honor. That's what Joseph wanted his father Jacob to know, what had befallen him and what had become of him and the position that he now occupied. I remember many, many years ago listening to a man preaching from the story of Joseph and he said the story of Joseph can be summarized quite simply like this. He was a man that was esteemed by his father, despised by his brethren, who became a leader in the land. And that is a very vivid and uh, clear and concise description of what takes place in these 13 chapters or so that deal with the story of Joseph. But you see, this chapter is the climax of the incident that begins in Genesis chapter 42, where uh, the sons of Jacob are sent again the second time down to Egypt uh, to seek corn in order that they might survive. And when they come, what we are told there in Genesis and chapter 42 and verse 8 is this, that Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. At that point in time, his glory was completely unrecognised. It was an unrecognized glory because Joseph knew his brethren, but they didn't have a clue who he was. Uh, I, I, I was brought up in a home where my father taught me to follow uh, the political wranglings. He uh, was a converted communist and he, he never gave up his great interest in politics and he would make me sit down and listen to the debates and one thing and another. And as a consequence of that, I still, to this present point in time, take great interest in what's happening in the world of politics. There's a word you could put over it at the moment, chaos. Um, but I was interested to read uh, last weekend in the newspaper the account of a man called Lord Carrington. Now, many of you here will remember 1981 and uh, the, the invasion of the Falkland Islands. And at the time, Lord Carrington was the Foreign Secretary, and with great honour and distinction, despite being tried to be persuaded otherwise, he resigned his position because he felt that he was to blame. And much was said about this man uh, and what he went on to achieve and accomplish as the Secretary General of the United Nations and one thing and another. But when he died last week at the ripe old age of 99, people discovered something about him that they knew nothing at all previously that during the Second World War in the year 1944, after the Allies had successfully invaded Normandy and began to make their way across Europe, they came to the Rhine. And the incident that took place at, at the Rhine was the Battle at Arnhem. It's depicted in a, in a very well-known film, A Bridge Too Far. I've actually visited the cemetery in Arnhem in Holland, and it's quite moving to be there. But during the, that battle... Peter Carrington, as he was then, showed great courage and great exploits as he led his men in a, in a tank and obeyed his orders to the last. And in the, in the newspaper, he described some of the things that went on. Now, prior to that, I, for one, knew nothing at all about his exploits during the Second World War. And that is, a, is an illustration, a picture of what is taking place here. 
when the sons of Jacob, the brothers of Joseph, come down into Egypt, all they see is one who is introduced to them as the governor of the land. He's the one unto whom they must go in order that they might secure sustenance for their family back home. And that is recorded for us here in in these chapters 42 and following. He is the governor of the land, we told you in verse 6. Now, Joseph, immediately recognizing his brother, plays a very clever trick. He understands them and what they're saying, but he speaks to them through an interpreter. And he is not introduced to them as Joseph, but he is introduced to them with the name that had been given to him by Pharaoh. He is the one, and he is the one alone, who has the authority to sell corn to them. They, for their way of life, are in a desperate situation. There's a famine. There's a need back home for food. But it's only he who can supply them with it. And immediately they come, he recognizes them. And Joseph knew his brethren. They have no idea whatsoever of who he actually is or the truth concerning him. Because over their earlier uh, misdeeds, in the way that they deceived him and they deceived uh, their father Jacob by selling him uh, and telling their father that he must be dead, they had no idea of the fact that overriding their evil deeds was the hand of of providence. The sovereign hand of God was at work, which becomes clear to us in the chapter that we read together. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. They had no idea that having been sold by them, he comes down into Egypt, into Potiphar's house. And then from Potiphar's house, because of the deceit of Potiphar's wife, he ends up in Potiphar's prison. And when he, he when his brothers appear to him here, as they come to him, you notice what we are told he remembers. Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them. As a young boy, they became envious of him, mainly because his father seemed to favor them more than him. The coat of many colors was one example of that. But he had dreams, and he said to his brothers that these dreams are, are to, you were to understand, and I guess there will come a day when you will be subservient to me. Of course, that riled them. Uh, and they were angry with him. And that's why they did what they did to him. And it seems here when, when we read these words that as they appear in Joseph's mind there flashes the remembrance of the dreams as a young lad back home and what he had told his brothers. And all that had befallen him in the intervening years leading up to this point in time. They have no idea what it is that he's gone through to become second only to Pharaoh in the throne. After they betrayed him and deceived their father, he's come to Egypt. But there's that lovely phrase that appears twice in Genesis 39. He comes to the house of Potiphar. God was with Joseph. He comes to the prison. God was with Joseph. And of course, while he was there in the prison after some time, the king was displeased with his butler and his baker. He sends them to the prison, and they dream dreams. Joseph interprets the dreams, and the dreams are fulfilled. The butler is returned to his position. The baker is hanged upon a tree. And then, sometime after that, we're not told exactly how long after that, Pharaoh is troubled by a dream that he's had. And there's a beautiful picture there, is there not? He brings all his wise men. All is soothsayers, or as we would say in the year 2018, the psychologists and the scientists and the politicians. Tell me what this dream is. They haven't got a clue. And then the butler says, Ah, when I was in prison, there was a young man there. And I had a dream. And he interpreted my dream. And it was fulfilled. And of course... Joseph is brought and he interprets to Pharaoh the dream and he tells him that there are going to be seven years of harvest the like of which they have never seen before 
But during those seven years, they must prepare for seven years of famine, the like of which they had never seen before. And Pharaoh poses the question quite justifiably towards the end of Genesis chapter 41, where he says, who is capable of preparing the nation for these times of dearth and of famine? And of course, it was quite obvious. The only one that had been able to interpret the dream was Joseph. And he makes him, in effect, the prime minister of the land. And he says to him, over to you, Joseph. And you have that lovely phrase, whatsoever he saith, do. You want corn? Go to Joseph. Joseph opens the storehouses when the dearth was in all the lands. And this was the glory that they were to tell their father of. But at this point in time, they have no idea who he was. He's a governor. He's a one who alone can help them through this difficult situation. The one who can supply corn for them. No idea what it was that he'd gone through to be in the position that he now enjoyed. A slave, a servant, deceived and tempted by a woman, imprisoned, but now exalted to be a prince amongst men in Egypt. Indeed, in the Psalm 105, we're told this, he was the ruler of all his substance, Pharaoh's substance, that is. He was the lord of his house. Do you know, my friends, the purpose of this incident and the whole of the scriptures, for that matter, is to point us in the direction of another Joseph. It's to point us in the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ because you remember he himself tells us that these scriptures speak of me. And you remember on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, beginning at Moses, in other words, in the book of Genesis, and in the Psalms and in the prophets, in all the scriptures, he spoke to them of the things concerning himself. And when we cast the searchlight of the New Testament upon this story, what do we see? Well, we see exactly this picture that is painted for us here. The Lord Jesus Christ is one whose glory, by the vast majority, is completely unrecognized. I wonder tonight if each and every one of us can bear testimony to the fact that we recognize the true glories of Christ. Or is he simply somebody you come to in times of desperate need, in a dire situation, but without realizing the truth concerning him? Lord Carrington, a great politician, but ah, what about his deeds during the time of war? And that's the picture that is painted for us here. And it gives to us a flavour of what the scriptures have to tell us concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Because all these incidents in the, in the life of Joseph, we can point to the same incidents in the life of our Saviour. Now, when we come to the scriptures of the New Testament, they have much to tell us about the glories of Christ. And if you turn over, for example, to the Acts of the Apostles and to the second chapter, you are confronted there with uh, the day of Pentecost. And there we uh, face to face with Peter, preaching upon the day of Pentecost. And he tells us something of the glories of Christ, of what I call this morning the uniqueness of Christ. Notice what we told you in Acts chapter and at verse 22 you men of Israel hear these words Jesus of Nazareth a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye also yourselves also know him that is Christ being delivered by the determinate counsel and for knowledge of God you've taken by wicked hands you've crucified and you've slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of them. Verse 32. This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this 
which now you see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou upon my right hand, until I make thy thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Do you know who he is? Do you realize who you crucified? Do you realize the uniqueness of this person that stood amongst you? Who now, has, as he promised, sent his spirit to dwell amongst us and to establish the New Testament church. Do you realize who he is? Or turn over again to, to the fifth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. The apostles have been in prison for preaching. The angel come and releases them. And what do they do? Well, they return to go back preaching. They, they can't be restored. They can't be restrained from preaching. That's what we're told in Acts 5 and verse 25. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men you put in prison are stand in the temple, teaching of the people. Then the captain and the officers uh, uh, brought them with, without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And this is what we are told in verses 30 and 31. The God of our fathers... Raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hang on a, hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a saviour, for to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. What about what the Apostle Paul says? When he writes the first epistle and to the Corinthians, he describes him in the opening, in the opening chapter, in the second chapter of that epistle like this. He describes him as the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world and our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. Joseph's brethren, they didn't know him. The princes of this world didn't know Christ. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. What does Peter go on to tell us in his epistles? At the end of chapter 3 of the first epistle, he says, Jesus Christ is gone into heaven. He's on the right hand of God. Angels, authorities, powers, subject unto him. How's he got there? Well, he's got there by sovereign right. Because he came in the fullness of time as the servant of Jehovah. He knew what it was to be tempted. He knew what it was to be innocently condemned. He knew what it was to be bound. But he knew also what it was to be exalted, as he now is. Behold my servant, in whom my soul delighteth, says the prophet. He washed his disciples' feet. He must meet, his meat was to do the will of him that sent me. He was conscious that he comes in obedience to his father's demands upon him, as the servant of of Jehovah. He knew what it was to be tempted. Matthew chapter 4. What does Hebrews tell us about that? It says, We have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are. Innocently condemned, just like Joseph. Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. He's done nothing wrong. He was bound to the cruel cross of Calvary. But as Peter said in that verse I quoted to you, he is now exalted. And as those verses in, in Acts 2 and Acts chapter 5 tell us, he is the prince and he is the saviour. Do you remember that of him and of him alone was ever a voice heard from heaven? First of all at his baptism and then upon the Mount of Transfiguration, which declared, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I like the way the Apostle Peter describes that. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty when there appeared there upon the holy mount and we heard a voice. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. My friends, do we realize what this Christ has gone through? And the position that he now occupies, rightly by that, where he now is. Seeing then that we have 
a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. What we were singing a, a, a little earlier, that great hymn of that Irish Anglican, Thomas Kelly. Look, look, he's saints. The sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now. From the strife return victorious. Every knee to him shall bow. Crown him, crown him. Crowns become the victor's brow. As Joseph demanded of his brethren that they tell their father of all his glory. So the responsibility that is placed upon you and I as Christian men and Christian women this evening hour is to tell this sad, sin-sick world and this sad, sick, sin-sick generation in which we live of the glories of the Christ of God and the majesty and the uniqueness that belongs alone to him because his glory is unrecognized by the vast majority of people. How we hear his name despised. How we hear uh, men and women thinking that they're being funny, ridiculing the things that you and I stand for in the gospel of Jesus Christ. What are we to do? What are we are to do is this, as they did there in the Acts of the Apostles. Can't shut us up. We must tell men and women of the glories of of Christ, how he stands apart, how unique he is, how other he is than anything else that is by offered by any man or any woman in this sad, sin sick world in which we live. His glory was unrecognized. But then we read later in that same chapter something quite remarkable. We're told that in verse 23, they, that is, the brothers of Joseph, knew not Joseph. You see, he's requested that Benjamin come down. Later on, we discover at the end of chapter 44 that Judah pleases the, pleads the cause of, of Benjamin. Uh, but immediately, he tells them what his requirement is. Their conscience is a pricked. Because in verse 21, they start arguing amongst themselves. And their minds are taken back to when they sold Joseph into Egypt. They don't know that Joseph is before them. But immediately their consciences are pricked. And as they discuss their misdeeds of years gone by, we are told this, they knew not that Joseph understood them. For he spake unto them by an interpreter. They didn't recognize the glory of his understanding, the understanding glory of Christ. And the thing that he understood, first of all, was their sin. He understood the consciences that were theirs that were now troubled. He understood the deceitfulness of their hearts. It, it, is, it was as if no secret was hidden from him. Because in verse 20 of this chapter, we are told that their whole destiny was in his hands. Bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and you shall not die. In other words, their lives were in his hands. He understood that, but they were to come to understand that. Their destiny was in his hands. It's with him if they survive or if they perish. Now, my friends, when we bring again the searchlight of the New Testament, we see something here of the nature and of the character of Christ. We are face to face with what theologians call one of his essential attributes. He is one who has all knowledge. He is omniscient. And that is exemplified for us on many occasions during the life of of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember uh, when we come to John chapter 4 and he's there at the well and there's this woman that comes and he engages in conversation with her. And she says to him about her husbands and he said, you've had five husbands. And the man that you're with now, he's not your husband. She was amazed. How did she know? How did he know that? Well, of course, it was made clear to her, come see a man 
that told me all things ever I knew, ever I did. The understanding glory of Christ. He understood what the prophet Jeremiah said when he wrote in chapter 17, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? He has that knowledge which is exemplified again in, in the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. He saw him. It's a lovely phrase. He saw him when he was a great way off. It is only Christ who really understands human nature. And what he has to say about it is not pleasant. I remember there was a phone in on the radio some, some time ago where a psychologist who, who didn't profess in any stretch of the imagination to be a Christian uh, was there uh, and he was discussing uh, some terrible atrocity that had taken place. I, I forget the precise uh, details now. Uh, but his argument was that this terrible deed that had been performed was it within the capability of anybody. And of course you can imagine uh, the response to that. The telephones would go and the emails were coming in and saying how ridiculous, how terrible to suggest that people could behave, anybody could behave in a fashion like this character had, uh, it, had, had so done in, in murdering somebody, I believe it was. But you see, my friends, the Bible tells us that human nature is such that we're all capable of the most evil of deeds. The heart is deceitful. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? If it is not for the restraining hand of the grace of God, then we are capable of the most despicable of acts. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And if that isn't enough, says the psalmist in Psalm 14, I'll say it again in Psalm 53. And the Apostle Paul in presenting the case for the prosecution in the opening chapters of the epistle to the, of, to the epistle to the Romans uses those psalms to explain to us the depravity of the human heart. You remember what Paul says about it in Ephesians chapter 4. He gives us a vivid description here of, of the true nature of mankind. He says this in, in Ephesians 4 and verse 18. The understanding darkened alienated from the life of God, ignorance in them, the blindness of their hearts. And Joseph knew the true character of these brothers. And he knows, does Christ, our real and our true characters, what terrors, what horrors, sin as inflicted upon us. It makes men and women behave in the most despicable of ways. And it grieves the heart of the Christian when it sees such behaviour being exemplified by so many. It's all a consequence of the fall. It's all a consequence of sin because we're darkened, we're alienated, we're ignorant, we're in blindness. As Mr Luther put it, he says, we have a want of conformity unto and are transgressors of any law of God. You want to know the extent to which God understands us? Well, you turn to the Psalm 139. And you know what we are told there in the verse 16? These words. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. What does he mean? He said, before you were ever conceived in your mother's womb, I knew all about you. Do you realise the grandeur and the glory of Christ this evening hour, my friends, that no secret is hidden from him? He understands everything that it is possible to know about us? You know, earlier on in, in, in Genesis chapter chapter 39, where, where Joseph is alone with Potiphar's wife. Why was it that he wouldn't succumb to her deeds? After all, he was a young man. He knew all the, uh, he knew all the desires of, of, of a man for a woman. Why didn't he succumb? Because there was a third set of eyes there, that's why. Looking down upon him. The eyes of God beholding his deeds. And he fled and suffered the consequences of it. 
my friends, this God, this Christ, his glory is, understands all about us. Who else dare we speak of that has such glory as that? And he says to his brothers, go and tell my father of all my glory in Egypt. Well, eventually the story rolls on until we come to this then 45th chapter of the book of Genesis. And after he has listened to the plea at the end of chapter 44 of Judah on behalf of his brother Benjamin, we are told this, Joseph could not refrain himself before all that stood by him. And he cried, cause every man to go out for me, from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known. He made himself known. They knew not that it was Joseph, but he knew them. They knew not that he understood them. But now he makes himself known unto them. In other words, his full glory is going to be revealed to them as he makes himself known to them. You imagine the staggering realisation of what he says to them in verse 3. I am Joseph speechless you a Joseph our brother that we sold and despised and this is where you now are yes he says I am Joseph you see he's alone with them and he makes himself known to them you know the remarkable thing in these verses in the first half of this chapter is this how gracious he is in his dealings with them. How he demonstrates such compassion and mercy. How he desires to relieve their suffering. As he makes known to them in verse 6 the true extent of the famine. There's only been two years, he says. There's another five years of famine to come. What happens when his glory was revealed to them? Well, they were troubled in his presence. Verse 3, the end of it. His brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. What does he do to them? He says to them, verse 4, come near to me. Verse 5, let me reassure you. Don't be grieved nor angry with yourselves that he sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Verse 9, he commands them to haste. Go to my father and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. He wants to nourish them. In verse 11, there I will nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine. And in verse 15, he kissed his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. In other words, there was a communion, one with the other. Do you know what happens when the glory of Christ is revealed to a sinner? Exactly that. They're troubled at his presence oh my friends it's sad to say today that very very rarely do you hear spoken of from pulpits the truth of conviction of sin people in sorrow for their sins oh what is the invitation so many well meaning in, in many respects I'm sure come to Jesus all will be well all be happy just come you come with reverence. You come with godly fear. You come trembling at your knees because you realize you're under the judgment of him in whose hands your destiny lies. But what does he do when his glory is revealed to us, when he is made known to us in the gospel? He says, come near to me. Let's pardon your sin. Let's deal with your past. Let's remove your sin as far as the east is from the west. Come and let me reassure you. Come and, and with haste and take hold of the promises of eternal life. Come and be nourished in the things of God. Come and commune with me. And I ask the question tonight, my friends, has the glory of Christ been revealed to you? Do you see this Christ as his brethren said, I'm Joseph. I am Christ. I am the bread of life. Listen. 
There's only one place that will ever be made clear to you. No other place but in this book, the Bible. It's the only place you'll discover Christ. I don't know when it was the last time I sang this hymn, but as I was preparing this, it came to me with great force. It's the battle hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Our God is marching on. What does he unveil himself to them as? The one esteemed by his father. Yes, who has been despised by his brethren. But now is a ruler in the affairs of men. There's some lovely examples of that, are there not, in, in the Bible, in, in the New Testament particularly. They're in the Old Testament as well. But you think of that poor sad man that was executed alongside Christ, ridiculing him. And then something happened, something quite remarkable. He turns to his colleague and he says, We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. This man hath done nothing amiss. And in that act of repentance and remorse, the words of reassurance and comfort and consolation come to him. Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. We sing of it, do we not? The dying thief rejoice to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Ere since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. You remember what young Timothy says concerning the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 6 and verses 15 and 16. Jesus Christ, who is the blessed and the only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwell in light unto the which no man can approach, and, to, and whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be glory and honour and power everlasting. Oh, the glories, the majesty, the splendour, the esteem of this Christ. What does John tell us in the opening chapter of the book of the Revelation? He says he's got the keys of death and of hell. I may have told you this before, but I, I make no apology for repeating it. It's something uh, that I've never, ever forgotten. It was quite remarkable. It was the summer of 1991, and I was present in the Crown Court in Cardiff. And uh, the ceremony was the swearing in of magistrates. And after they'd all taken their oath, the judge who was listening to the oaths alongside him was the Lord Lieutenant in all their splendor and all their glory. He said, young magistrates, welcome to the judiciary. But remember this, there will come a day when you all will stand before the judge of all judges. And you could sense the amazement that somebody would be bold enough to say such a thing as that. My wife nudged me and she said, don't say amen, because that's what I felt like. Remember this, there will come a day when you will stand before the judge of all judges. My dear friends, that's who we're dealing with. That's something of the glory of Christ. There will come a day when he will say to non-believers, depart from me. I never knew you. As these boys knew not Joseph, but they came to know him. And he will separate the sheep from the goats, but to others. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Remember those words of the Apostle John when he said, when we shall see him, we shall be made like unto him, for we shall see him as he is. 
when the full orb of his glory will be manifest to all as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. No wonder that the angelic host and the saints of every kindred and tongue and nation and people will join together that day and sing the words of Revelation chapter 5. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, who has redeemed us to God by his blood from every kindred and tongue and nation and people. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. The words of a whole hymn that come to me, when by his grace I shall look on his face, that will be glory, be glory for me. Tell my father of all my glory in Egypt. May the glory of this Christ be our portion now and always. Amen.